I'm so happy to, to have you have you all here tonight. So uh, we begin usually with about a half an hour sit, and then there's a little time to stretch, and then um, I'll offer some some reflections. So I'll just um, I've got a bell here, and I'll just ring it once as a kind of centering sound. So I'd also like to say before we begin, it's really helpful when we begin to sit just to have some kind of intention. And a great intention is to be kind to yourself in your practice. So you can choose whatever you'd like as an intention, but um, just have a sort of, of aspiration uh, for your practice this evening. And even if it's not your, your initial intention, I would encourage you in addition, just to be kind to yourself. So gently allow yourself to come into the body. No rushing, just a very gentle settling into the body. Letting the body be. And let yourself feel welcomed. Welcomed in your body, welcomed in this space. Take to heart that you belong. And you can use whatever practice is most appropriate. Some people like to use the breath as a way of stabilizing. Some people like to use hearing. But if you don't have a choice, I would encourage you to experiment with a receptive open awareness. See if it's possible to let go of doing and especially letting go of striving. And just be open to whatever arises and passes away. <clears throat> if there's any irritation, any imp impatience, just give that a lot of space. You don't have to cling to it and you don't have to push it away.
just see if it's possible to rest in this mindful awareness
And for the last few minutes of our meditation tonight, see if it's possible for you to just bring about kind of a, a felt sense of appreciation or gratitude. Just let the mind rest for a minute in that, that sense of appreciation. Perhaps it's gratitude for the support we give to and get from each other when we come together like this. So take a minute to stretch or adjust or take a drink. So my name is Patrice Kelch. I use she, her, hers pronouns. And I'm a longtime student of the Dharma and um, a sometimes occasional teacher at Common Ground. And I wanted to begin tonight by talking about my first residential retreat, which was in 19... 96 or 97, and um, I think it was for five days, I was extremely anxious about, you know, excited and anxious. What gave me the most anxiety was I had been told that you're not supposed to read anything when you're on retreat. And I just thought, how does anyone go to sleep without a book in front of them? You know, just, that was just really hard to imagine. So actually I put some books in my car. I didn't bring them into the retreat center, but I had them in the car in case I had a reading emergency. And uh, so I started the retreat and um, you know, just really intent on practicing mindfulness. And as I tried to you know, be with the breath and be focused. All I could hear over and over again was the song, Puff the Magic Dragon. And you know, it seemed like in my mind, the, the more I tried to concentrate, the louder the volume got with Puff the Magic Dragon, you know, lives by the sea, frolicked in the Autumn Mist and a Man Called Hanali, on and on and on. So all the verses. And uh, I was quite put out by this. And uh, <clears throat> so when I went to the teacher, I explained that I had this, this problem and I wanted her to fix it. I wanted her to tell me how to fix it. 
And she said, oh, well, you may hear Puff the Magic Dragon for a very, very long time, but that's not the problem. The problem is the way you're relating to hearing Puff the Magic Dragon. And this was um, astonishing to me. And I spent a good bit of that retreat exploring that idea. And I would say a lot of my practice has been about exploring the notion of how I'm relating to something. It's always a good question to ask. How, I'm, how am I relating to this? Because many of us come to meditation practice you know, with a sense of wanting to fix something that's a problem. Sometimes we imagine that we are the problem. Um, you know, some of us want to get calmer, to slow down our busy lives, or even to mend our broken hearts. We seek relief, uh, restoration, reinvigoration. And I'm really drawn to Buddhist practice, specifically mindfulness training, training in clear seeing, the moral training in non-harming, and the heart opening trainings of, of loving kindness because of their empirical experiential nature. Ehi pasiko is what the Buddha said. He said, come and see for yourself what is the value of these trainings and teachings? And Joseph Goldstein's first teacher, Manindraji, told him if he wanted to understand the mind, he should sit and watch his mind. And this sitting and watching the mind often results in our first meditative insight, namely that the mind is flighty and unreliable. It's like a monkey left to its own devices in a 7-Eleven. And as we begin to train the mind with patience and humor and a realization that this is our common predicament. So over time, as our mindfulness practice progresses, we come to have experiential understanding of the three characteristics of existence. Dukkha, the unsatisfactory nature of our experience, which is to say the imperfect nature of our experience, anicca, the impermanent nature of our experience, and anatta, the impersonal nature of our experience. And understanding that these characteristics undergird all of our experience all the time lets us regard our experience with a kind of clarity and coherence. And I think actually this is somewhat analogous to understanding science. For example, um, we know that the earth is rotating around the sun, but our experience seems to be that the sun and the moon are moving through um, through the sky. And um, we know that uh, our eyes are not uh, merely windows on the world, but that visual perception is a complicated neurological process. So we don't need to know either of these facts in order to live in the world, but knowing them, knowing that the earth is moving around the sun, knowing that seeing is a very complex neurological process gives us a more appreciative understanding of the complexity of the world and how important it is to go beyond appearances. And in a way, I'm suggesting that understanding these three characteristics, that it's sort of the same for that, that um, seeing these three characteristics of experience Let's the, our whole experience become more intelligible in a way. And my wonderful teacher, Ruth King, puts it this way. Everything is imperfect 
impermanent, impersonal. This is a Ruth King mantra. Everything is imperfect, impermanent, impersonal. We become aware of this first characteristic, this imperfection characteristic, almost as soon as we start meditating. You know, our posture is never perfect. What's comfortable for a minute becomes uncomfortable in 15, and that's only the body. You know, the mind does its own, its own trick. And uh, my friend Joanne says, uh, even when you have a good, a good sit, she said, on a retreat, the worst thing that can happen to you is having a good sit early in the morning because you spend the rest of the day just craving to have another good sit. So this is dukkha. It's a poly word that derive. It's a poly word that actually derives from what happens when the hub of a wheel doesn't quite fit the axle etymologically. So in other words, we experience dukkha when we're out of alignment. You know, when the when the axle doesn't fit the hub, when there's a clunk, 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 clunk. So it's when we are out of alignment with the way things are, we don't get what we want, we get what we don't want, we can't control how things are. And it's really hard to, uh, to find ourselves ever in alignment. And, um, Common Ground's friend and frequent guest teacher, Sandy Caro, talks about dukkha as difficult to bear. And he always talks about it and thinking about it too in the most difficult sense of like bearing something, having something on your back, difficult to bear, difficult to hold up, difficult to be upright when, when one is experiencing dukkha. Things are never perfectly permanently in alignment with our wishes, and we're never perfectly in alignment with the way things are. So everything is imperfect. And we, I mean, we see that in our, our sitting experience, and we see that wanting things to be perfect is such a cause of suffering. It's such a, such a burden. And even if things are pretty good for us sometimes, part of our dukkha is that we know it can't stay that way. Things are imperfect, partly because they're not permanent. And this is the second characteristic of existence, Anicca. And early in his public teaching, the Buddha said that the Dharma eye sees that everything that arises must pass away, that that was seeing the teachings. Everything that arises passes away. Every aspect of our experience is conditioned, conditioned and conditional. Every aspect of our experience is the result of a variety of causes and everything is always changing on a macro and micro level. Everything is always changing and it's changing because it's caused everything. It's caused, it comes into being, it passes away and every cause and the effect, the effect gives rise to another cause. Everything is constantly, constantly changing. And we see this on a, you know, a macro and micro level. Our fingernails are, are growing every single day and our bodies are aging every single day. Our homes need repair and our climate is changing. We see change all the time. It is the inescapable fact of our existence. 
And in mindfulness meditation, we see thoughts arise and pass away, and sometimes very quickly. It's really in our mindfulness practice, we really get to uh, taste impermanence in a very clear way. And part of uh, Buddhist practice is uh, doing the five daily meditations on, on mortality. Uh, I am of the nature to age. I am getting old. I am of the nature to sicken. Illness and infirmity await me. I'm of the nature to die. My death approaches daily. And all that is dear and delightful to me will be separated from me. All that is dear and delightful to me will be separated from me, will become otherwise. And then I am the inheritor of my past karma, the owner of my present karma, and the fabricator of my future karma. So this reflection about constant change and our responsibility to act ethically, to act with mindfulness, about the consequences of our actions is, is one of the truly great, great teachings. And it's always this, this fourth one about all that is dear and delightful to me will be separated from me is really the, the piercing one, realizing that fundamental truth of impermanence. And it really underscores how futile it is to cling. Impermanence really teaches us about non-clinging. Really underscores that. And the third characteristic of existence is anatta. And this is probably the most subtle. It's sometimes talked about as no self, but that's, that's really misleading. A more accurate translation and understanding is not self. We can look at any of our thoughts, our emotions, our attributes, and see that they are all conditioned and impermanent. For example, when I think about my own attributes or identities, you know, female, white, Buddhist, vegan, married, mother, grandmother, all of them might have been otherwise. None of these is essentially me. They're all in some, some really important way contingent, conditioned. They come into being. And the wonderful um, Buddhist eco-feminist philosopher, Joanna Macy, has a really wonderful way of talking about this. Um, she talks about this, she says, I am a flow through that all of these sorts of identities and characteristics are just a, a flow through. She is always in process. Nothing sticks, everything is, is moving. And you know, so often Mark and, and Shelley will talk about, you know, everything is always moving. And we see that, especially when we look deeply in relation to the self. Um, another, and I think more helpful way, sometimes for me thinking about this anatta characteristic 
this not self, is to think that experience is impersonal, the impersonal nature of, of experience. That things happen due to causes and conditions. So an example, a sort of a personal example from my life is um, a number of years ago, I worked for an agency that had some discretionary money every month that was available for people to, uh, to help pay for rent or utilities or other kinds of things. But because there was always more, there were always more requests than there were funds, uh, they had a lottery. So every month there was a lottery for these funds. And when people got uh, a letter saying, you know, there were no funds to cover your lottery request this month, but you could call this line and see if there's any other resources. And I was that other, other line. And, you know, I would say, well, you know, could you call the county for it? See if the county had any money for rent. Could you, you know, I would have a number of possibilities, but most of them were things that people already knew about and had tried. And people would be really angry and they'd yell. And it was totally impersonal. I never took it personally because I was just kind of the placeholder there. And in fact, I thought, and I'm a really safe placeholder because there's no way anyone would be harmed by being mad at me or being um, being angry with me. And it was such a great example for me at the time when that happened. I think yeah, this is about the impersonality of, of experience. Uh, and so much of our experience is in this way, that we just happen to be, the causes and conditions come together and our experience is one way rather than another. So, you know, so often people say, you know, don't take it personally, which is kind of hard sometimes. But in this very, very, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> on this very deep Dharma level, don't take it personally is really, really true. And um, tragically, um, if people were listening to yesterday's um, testimony at the Derek Chauvin trial, there was such a poignant example of this. The young woman who um, took the, the video recording of the murder of George Floyd said that you know, she stayed away nights knowing that that could have been her father, her brothers, her uncle, her friends, all the black men that she knows and loves, that it could have been any one of them. And that is, a, I think, a really clear and heartbreaking example of the impersonality of experience. So it's, um, the question then I guess is what do we do with this? And Ruth King with this mantra of everything is imperfect, impermanent, impersonal, something I say to myself frequently it actually grounds us to be more skillful and effective in the choices that we make. Deeply, deeply knowing that nothing is perfect, nothing is permanent, and nothing is truly personal. We can avoid superficial disappointments, and we can place our intentions, attention, and efforts on the liberatory work that we need to do for ourselves and our communities, recognizing always everything is imperfect, impermanent, impersonal. And this returns um, us to the initial story about 
feeling that my practice was being sabotaged by the greatest hits of Peter, Paul, and Mary. When the three characteristics are intelligible to us, we can see clearly that it's all about how we are relating to them. It's all about how we are relating to the fact that things are imperfect, impermanent, and impersonal. We're really seeing the underlying structure of our experience. And then the question is, how do we relate skillfully to that? So we have lots of time for discussion tonight. And um, I hope that that was helpful to you as sort of a, a platform for, for discussion. It's something that has been really important in my own, uh, my own appreciation of the Dharma. So please unmute yourself with any comments or if you have any questions, if anything wasn't clear, you'd like me to um, go over anything, I would be happy to do that too. Back that I have thought was really unfair or um, not helpful. One of the things that, that I've done is thought, this person may be having a really bad day and um, I'm getting this. Or sometimes I think this person is not very skillful. You know, you can try to sort out what criticism um, seems salient and appropriate and what's not. Because you know, many of us have had the experience of having uh, a supervisor say, you know, you are really great on these six things and here's the seventh and this is one area that you could improve on. And what we obsess on is number seven, like the one thing we could improve on. So one thing is just to make it bigger. Like when, when you get feedback, that seems harsh, um, give it a, a bigger space and, and see whether it, it's, I mean, it's landed on you and you might wanna say, should this have landed in, in this kind of way? Was that person um, being harsh, being fair? I mean, it's just, it, and you can just sort of speculate about that. So sort of making a little more room or you, you might discover that, you know, this person always does this to the people who are, are supervised. So you can explore some other things instead of immediately taking it personally. And when, you know, in relationships, which are, are often really difficult, um, you know, there are always at least two people in a relationship. And, you know, you have your part of it, but the other person has their part of it. So, you know, sometimes when someone says, I don't want to be with you anymore, it might be a lot of their own stuff. So one of the things about taking things personally, it's sort of like clinging. We, we grab and make things very personal. We take things that are um, not ours and take that personally. So it's not that, that either of those two experiences aren't painful getting that sort of, of criticism from someone and having someone leave in a relationship. But what you could explore is, you know, how much of it really is about you and what are some other possibilities of uh, what might be what might be happening. Um, I had the have had the experience recently of my um, 12 year old granddaughter um, who lives on the other side of the earth, um, you know, not returning my texts, not my phone. And I, you know, I was feeling very, you know, kind of personal uh, about that. And I, you know, sort of said, you know, she's a, a moody 12 year old. And I've really been trying to work with the, the, um, second precept about not taking anything that's not freely given to me. And I think she doesn't want to freely give her time to me right now. 
why do I think I should take, why do I, should I think I'm entitled to it or I should take that? And so it was in, in a way that gets back to sort of that making things personal and it, it is a practice. Um, so again, you're pointing to, it's all about how we relate to it. You know, that it's not about me, but this about me. And, and how do we relate to that? And finding that skillful, skillful way to, um, to work with that. Other thought, you know, understanding that both you and your partner are conditioned beings, that there are all these sorts of causes and conditions. That, that come together. And that's really another example where we really skillfully relate. When we see that, when we see that, that there are, you know, our lives are just these constellations of causes and, and conditions and understanding that. And then as Julian was suggesting, not clinging. You know, when we, when we can see that um, more clearly, and this is the, that idea about impersonality, when we see that more clearly, we are less likely to, to cling when we recognize its impermanent nature and its imperfect nature. You know, when we sometimes uh, encounter people who are really, really difficult to recognize the, of their conditioning, and then also sometimes just um, when we see people who are acting really, really unskillfully, just to imagine what would it be like to have a mind like that? And you know that a mind like that is a mind that's suffering. So as Jillian suggested, that really becomes a real, um, a real source for a very genuine compassion. It's sort of an, an art, it's, it's what we, uh, when we can let go of our fixed ideas or let go of our attachment to an outcome um, and just understanding that, you know, there are all these causes and conditions that are at play. And sometimes that's really often, that's a very skillful, skillful response is to, is to let go. Um, you know, our intention not to harm and letting go sometimes is the way to do that. Tension, like as, as Tracy was talking about, you know, like paying attention to how unpleasant something is and just staying with what that experience is instead of sort of taking it and, and running with it. Um, that's so useful when we can, can stay with that. And we can do that off, more often on retreat just because the conditions support that. You know, in our daily lives where, um, we're sort of always, uh, you know, there are just so many claims <laughs> on our attention. And so it's, it's hard often to, to really notice, um, notice that this is just um, unpleasant. This is, is just um, how it is, but it's, um, you know, there's just so much more momentum in our daily lives to sort of construct things out of it. So one of, I, I have found, as uh, Tracy said, one of the, the real benefits of retreat is being able to have that sort of sustained um, attention and, uh, and having the, the time where things sort of settle down so that it's possible to really pay attention in a way that it's just often not in our ordinary lives because so many things are impinging on us and that the insights in on retreat are things that really do um, carry over. is really such a source of, of compassion for, um, for how people experience their, their lives. And when we can have self-compassion um, for ourselves, 
as well as for those other individuals. And it sounds like a, a year of tremendous loss for you. And I, um, I'm really sorry for your, for your losses and hope that you'll find in, in doing self-compassion that, um, that you know, you'll find some, uh, some comfort in, in that. Because one of the things that when we practice self-compassion um, and we realize how, how, um, how our pain and suffering is, one of the things that we realize is that it's not unique to me that there are other people who have this kind of pain and suffering, other people who've lost parents or siblings so that you, know, you sort of have um, other, other suffering people understand exactly how it is that you are suffering now. I mean, that, that one of, in, in self-compassion, um, it becomes a less lonely place when we realize how others are suffering in this way too, the same sort of pain that we have and feel that sort of solidarity in a way. We can feel understood in a way. That's often really, really helpful. This pain is real. Others know this pain too and know how real it is. So it's a beautiful, beautiful practice. Really appreciate your all being here this evening and we can end with our um, wonderful sharing of the merit, this uh, chance we have to practice imaginative generosity on a, a massive scale. So if there's any goodness to our practice, any benefit, any merit, we would happily, gladly, joyfully share it. In fact, if we could, we would give it all away. We would give it to our parents, our teachers, our friends, our families, people we like, people we don't like, people we know, and all the people we don't know. And in addition to the two-legged, we'd give these benefits to the four-legged, the winged, the many-legged, the slithery and the scaly. May all beings find a path of peace. May all beings be free from suffering. So good night, everyone. Thanks so much. <laughs>